So what we've got happening here this morning, I'm going to tell you a bit more about this particular study group, the Meerkat Magic Conservation Project, Otsur in Western Cape, South Africa. This is the Ungu Lungu Meerkat group, or Ungu Lungu, which is from the Yei language, that's Y-E-I for bushbuck. We like to use African theme names here. It's much easier to remember names and codes, like female 709, male 308. So we give them common names as well. They all have codes, but we like to give them names too. You can even cast your own vote on our online database if you would like to partake in this. It's anonymous, and then the most popular names ultimately get used. <laughs> Again, the sounds I'm making are just a reassurance to the animals to know that it's me. I'm used to the sounds I make. They're not meerkat sounds, just lets them know where I am. All right. To the right, we have the dominant female, born in September 2006, known as Tsabokulori. Tsabokulori Ungulungu. Tsabokulori means millipede in Tswana. And in front of her from November 2008, the sole survivor of last year, the next female in this group who could potentially inherit this group one day as the matriarch, we have Shongololo, which is Zulu for millipede. And then the new dominant male who arrived here in June this year only from one of our study groups, busy grooming the newly emerged babies who were born on the 25th of August this year, the first litter from the current dominant female. His name is Bomani, which is warrior. The others who come up, I might tell you more about as they arrive. There are four babies in this litter and they're doing very well so far. All right, lovely stretch over there. And again, a bit of huddling, a bit of sunning. But even now, when the babies are being huddled, there's one up on guard. All right. I'm going to pause there for a moment and over to you. Please ask any questions you like. Anything. Thank you. I'm just so amazed by them. They're so cute. <laughs> <laughs> You've all passed that clearance test brilliantly, so thanks. The meerkats are not staring at you now means they've accepted your presence now as non-threat objects as such. And as we get more sunlight coming up through the clouds, hopefully, meerkats will become more and more active and then we can see what they go get for breakfast in a while. Still got some that might come up. All right. Is it only the dominant female that can have volition or not? Ah, thank you. That's a very nice question and I like the way you put it as well. Is it the only one? No. <laughs> There's a great deal of confusion in the media and in textbooks about this. It is, in fact, no, the dominant female is not the only one who has babies. But, in textbooks, it records meerkats something like this. Primi Paris, or single breeding female, and this is not correct. Many females have young within a meerkat group, but there's not enough food in the semi-desert to feed all of those babies. So what tends to happen is they all help to raise the young together. And that is why meerkats are one of the best known examples in the world of a cooperative, sociable breeding mammal. Everyone helps to raise the young. Mother, father, young, old, unrelated even. But the reason I'm mentioning this is usually only the dominant female's babies tend to survive. So they all help to raise her babies. It's a lot more complicated than that though, because meerkats have what we call reproductive suppression being practiced. The dominant female will aggressively evict or chase out any possible breeding females, and they can reach estrus about nine months in the wild. They could breed six months in captivity. And she'll chase these females out to try and prevent them getting pregnant at the same time as she does, to prevent competition. If you look at a banded mongoose, for example, some say they're multiparous, have multiple litters at the same time. They live in the tropics and subtropics of Central and East Africa, for example. Big groups, they all have enough food there to raise lots of litters at the same time. It's not a threat for foraging competition, etc. Meerkats, instead, they all help to raise those young. The mother cannot afford to stay behind looking after the babies during the day. She leaves to go get enough energy to lactate, produce milk. Usually only at the end of the day she might return to the group, burrow where the babies are. And what's just happened here, there was a little scent mark from Shongololo, that younger female, to one of the babies. Again, the group has got its own scent. Babysitters are animals who will spend up to a day or even two days sometimes without any food looking after somebody else's young. Almost always it's not their own young that will be raised successfully, but the dominant females. Genetic research has shown that they get a benefit from raising nephews, siblings, etc. Nieces as well, of course. So, dominant female is usually the only successful one.
to raise her young, many others have young, and lose these young. That's a very short story of it. When females get evicted, they usually meet up with wandering males, I mentioned migrants, forming coalitions, two or three together sometimes, and then they meet up with females on the outskirts of the territory. When males follow the females, they follow the females because the females know where they're going. If they don't, they'll die. The females are the leaders because they inherit males, migrate and lose that knowledge of their territory, leave it behind them. Quite an important point in conservation, just briefly there, because we encourage landowners to protect areas and not plow over burrows, especially corridors from one area to the next where males can then migrate in safety to prevent any problems with genetics within a study group like this. They need to have other groups that can have males migrating into this group at certain times. For example, if the dominant female was to die, the next oldest female will become the leader, probably her, one of her oldest daughters, and males from another group would migrate into the group. If the dominant male died, males would come into this group, dominant female would then mate with the new males. So, if the dominant female dies, her daughter is not going to mate with her father and other males, for example. So they are going to leave. So males are constantly migrating in search of these vacancies, as I like to mention before. And females are inheriting. So when females get evicted, males meet up with them, get them pregnant. The females usually abort their young under stress. They lose their young and they're still producing milk. If they survive an eviction, and quite often they don't. It's very dangerous to be out of a meerkat group, a lone meerkat or just a few together because they cannot look out for danger, feed themselves and their young easily. Because often the food is beneath the ground, so how do they watch out for the eagle overhead, for example? When they return, they're still producing milk. And if they're allowed back into the group and are very submissive to the dominant female who's already had her young almost always, she will allow them back in. And then her babies will also allosuckle from these allolactating females also producing milk, briefly. All right, so no, it's not only the dominant female that has young. <laughs> That's the short answer. <laughs> All right, babies are coming up nicely over there. Getting quite a lot of huddling happening as well. Brrrr. <laughs> <laughs>